The end is upon us. Time's up. We can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Months of worrying, guiding our plants, and watchfully waiting are finally coming to an end. Well, I don't know, Bob. We can finally see the fruits of our labor before us. Oh, brother. Oh, brother is right. It's the end of harvest, and in this video, we're going to review these final weeks of the flowering phase, address the controversy that is flushing, and stick around for some tips and tricks so you can be best prepared for the big day when you finally cut down those beauties in your tent. I'm Dr. Judd with Green Cert MD. Let's get into it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of our Growing Made Easy series. I've been out of the country for the past 10 days, hunting new strains and making some great upcoming content for the channel, but the time has come to, in the words of the great Willie Nelson, pick up the tempo just a little and take this grow on home. If you're new here, welcome. It would really help out the channel if you took the time to click like, smash that subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming content. Additionally, as always, this video is for medical educational purposes. I am not diagnosing or treating any condition you may have, and please adhere to all laws wherever you may live. As I move through these last few weeks of the flowering phase, I am currently feeding my plants according to my published nutrient schedule, which in my case is from House and Garden, and I am no longer looking for any nutrient deficiencies, as there really isn't time or the need to correct them at this late stage, though I do want to avoid nutrient burn from overfeeding. In our last video, we covered a few ways to determine if your buds are nearing the optimal time for harvest, and I am now viewing my buds daily under magnification. Ideally, I'm looking for darkened pistils, with around 85% of the trichomes milky white and the rest turning an amber color at the time of harvest. That's what I want for the time of harvest, which actually means right now I'm looking for about 65-70% to 70 milky white and a smattering of amber trichomes as a sign to start my flush, something we will address later in this video. I am also working to keep the humidity in the tent down in the 40-55% to 55 range, as we don't want it so high that it promotes fungal growth and bud rot. At this point, my inline exhaust fan is pretty much running full out, sucking in the walls of the tent. I live in the Midwest, and right now it is summer, but your environment may be quite different from mine. Someone in Phoenix, Arizona, or high in the mountains of Colorado might be looking to humidify their grow room still, while our coastal viewers in Mississippi may have to acquire a dehumidifier to have any chance of bringing their humidity below 70%. I also wanted to briefly address bloom boosters, and I am going to start off by saying that I do not personally add any bloom boosters outside of my chosen nutrient line for a few reasons. The first is that I have personally been happy with the results of my harvests, which generally produce dense buds with a THC spread of about 18-23%. to 23%. I have produced buds as high as 28%, but that is not something that I am personally chasing, and if this is your first grow, I would recommend staying the course with your chosen nutrient line and feeding schedule, and wait until the next grow to potentially add other things. Now, there are products in the full house and garden line that I am using, such as Bud XL and Top Booster, and I guess it's right there in the name, so the argument could be made that I am in fact using Bloom Boosters, it's just that I'm using the house and garden versions of them according to their recommended feeding schedule, and so if there is an optional product within your chosen nutrient line, and they have made provision for its usage, then go for it. So I've avoided it long enough, though this topic has already come up in the comments section on previous videos. Should you flush? And if so, for how long? Should you use enzymatics or isotonic leaching solutions? Well, as I pretty much say in every episode, I am showing you one way, out of many, to grow, and I am showing you what has worked well for me in the past. So let's address whether or not you should even flush. There was a study done by RX Green Technologies, which looked at the effects of a 14-day, 10-day, 7-day, and 0-day flushing of cannabis prior to harvest. They looked at percent yield, 
percent THC, and percent terpenes, as well as the mineral content of the flowers at harvest. They failed to identify any differences between flush treatments for yield, potency, or terpenes. And in fact, they said that taste panelists preferred the zero-day flush flower when consumed. So let me break down for you how a scientist, or in my case, an academic medical physician, approaches this type of study. First, I'm not aware of this study being published in any peer-reviewed journal. That is what amounts to what I would call a white paper, which is a study produced by a company that is scientific in nature, though perhaps not performed to the same rigorous levels required to reach the level of satisfying a scientific peer review and gaining approval for publication. Another factor that everyone should consider is the potential for bias, whether conscious or unconscious. And to that, I would point out that RX Green Technologies produces nutrients and growing medium substrates for the cannabis industry. While I cannot state that this fact in and of itself had any bearing on the study or its results, one can reasonably surmise that a company that produces nutrients for growing cannabis has a vested interest in not just avoiding a two-week cannabis flush and having people continue to feed their plants, i.e. buy nutrients, but they would also want to highlight a decidedly unscientific preference among taste testers for the unflushed cannabis produced using their specific nutrient line. Their results may be the actual truth, but the peer review process, publication of results, and most importantly, duplication through several iterative studies is how something goes from being a novel approach to becoming standard of care. I would argue that decades of cannabis growing experience has led to the flushing of cannabis broadly within the community, and I don't believe that this one study undoes the learned experience of growers over the past 100 years. So I choose to flush my cannabis, and I have done it in two main ways. The first approach I'm going to describe is what I call a long flush. In this scenario, I will again gauge when I'm about 10 to 14 days out from harvest by looking for that 60 to 70% milky white trichomes and a smattering of amber ones. I will then cease my cannabis nutrients, and I will use pH balanced water only, thereby allowing a gradual decrease of salts in the soil by both effectively flushing them from the soil over time, as well as through the continued plant uptake, which will lead to the plant leaves gradually yellowing as nutrients are consumed. The other method I've used is what I would call a short flush, and this is where I have continued feeding up until the final three to five days before my desired harvest date. I then use an isotonic leaching agent, in my case Clearex, to flush the soil and remove unwanted salts from it, resulting in a more immediate removal of the potential nutrients from the soil, leaving the plants with only their internal reserves to consume over those final three to five days, which again results in yellowing of the fan leaves. In this method, I will drench the soil daily until I get a proportionally larger runoff, approximately 40%, so that may mean two gallons per plant as I am growing in five gallon pots. So whichever method you choose for your flush, consider checking the electrical conductivity, or EC, of your runoff. Basically, I sample some of the water draining from my pot, placing it in a small cup and using our EC meter to check the runoff. pH should be around that of our solution going in, so around 5.8 to 6.2, and we want that EC to be dropping, perhaps more gradually with the longer flush method, versus somewhat faster with the shorter flush method. My goal is to have the EC down to about 0.5 to 0.6 by the last few days before harvest. Also, be aware that if you're using Clearex, the first few gallons that you run through your five gallon pots will produce very high EC numbers as the Clearex is leaching the salts out of the soil, giving you a big spike in EC that drops off usually pretty quickly. And by the third day of the short flush, you should be in that 0.5 EC range. So there you go, you've mastered the art of flushing. You knew I couldn't let the dad joke go, didn't you? If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon where our members are automatically entered in our monthly giveaways of things every grower loves. If you have any questions or if you would like to share alternate growing methods that have worked for you, leave us a comment below and be sure to share this video with a fellow grower who could use it. 
In our next video, we will finally harvest our plants, discuss wet versus dry trimming, and move ever closer to enjoying the fruits of our labor. So that's it for now, and until I see you again, puff puff and pass it on. I also wanted to briefly address Bloom Brewsters. Bleh Bloosters. Bloom Bloosters. Bloosters to bloom. And I will then cease my cannabis nutrients and use pH water only. Uh, pH balanced water only. Blah, 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 only. Versus somewhat faster with the short flush method. Short flush method. Try to say that three times fast. Short flush method. Short flush method. Short flush method.